hour webinar this morning. And to begin with, can I just um, remind you of the house rules? So please note the instructions for asking questions. You need to give your name and your location where you're coming from, please. Um, for those of you who are Venus students, please also um, change your name so that we have your student number and your name as well. Here we go, they are, these are the instructions there. All right, so um, you can see those there. And then the third point is obviously, please use um, your discretion about um, how you conduct yourself um, on this interview. Basically, you, can, uh, you, you should only tell us what you would tell your mother, nothing else. All right. Well, let's begin, shall we? I think um, we'll start with a little welcome speech from Irfan, and then I will introduce the speakers to you. Irfan, are you ready? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. Um, I guess good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Welcome to our KASS number four. Um, I would like to specially thank uh, our speakers uh, for the day. Yeah, I would like to thank Ibu Yosefa Iswandari. And I need to apologize on, on a silly mistake I made for using, you know, a, a different kind of name that she will explore later. <laughs> and thank you, Ibu. I know it's, it's uh, almost, probably close to midnight there in the United States. Thank you for making time for us. And uh, Ibu Diana, who is currently in Queensland as well. Um, her struggle is probably different with us time-wise, but thank you for making time amidst uh, your busy time as, as um, uh, a PhD student. And uh, Bu Jessica as well, who is not only uh, our, one of the speakers today, but also uh, she has been pretty busy preparing uh, this uh, cast series uh, for us to enjoy. And I would like also to thank uh, our uh, English department faculty members, uh, Bu Wiwi, Bu Maria, Pak Akun, and Pak David Bourne, Bu Risa, and um, everyone else uh, on the board of faculty members at the English department. Thank you so much for supporting us to have uh, KASS. So uh, I hope that uh, this one, because this one is specially designed for uh, our students and some students at the uh, Sanata Dharma University or the, the English department, educational, uh, okay, for the English department, yeah, that focuses on the teaching and learning of English uh, language. Yeah, so um, it's, 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 it's gonna be a small one. So I hope that uh, this small, webinar will be able to somehow inspire uh, our students, you know, that they will be able to see our speakers as not only models, but uh, people to look up to and uh, learn to. So again, I hope everybody uh, would be able to enjoy today's uh, sessions and the knowledge that our speakers are gonna share. These are gonna be the, the, the very practical type of knowledge that they are gonna share. I hope you guys are gonna learn a lot from them. So thank you very much again, speakers and uh, our team of faculty members. Uh, so I guess enjoy. Thank you, David. All right, thank you, Irfan. Um, just before we begin, can I ask the participants please to um, mute your video and audio. You are welcome to, have to ask any questions at any time. And to do this, please can you type your questions in the chat. We will deal with the questions in the last part of the um, of the of the webinar today, but pl please do not um, call them out while the speaker is um, speaking. 
All right, so let me introduce our speakers for the for today. Our first speaker, as Pak Irfan said, is coming to us all the way from the United States, um, where it is already late Thursday night. Um, she is Miss Yuseva Ariani Iswandari. She is a lecturer in the English Language Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University in Jogjakarta. She is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in Foreign Second Multilingual Language Education at the Ohio State University. She is the co-founder of the Indonesian Extensive Reading Association, an association that promotes the love of reading. Her research interests are EFL pre-service teacher professional development, extensive reading in EFL settings, and L2 reading writing connections. Now, our second speaker, Udiana Puspita Dewi, um, known to everyone as Udiana, or maybe Udi, if you know her well. She is currently working um, on her PhD in linguistic anthropology at the University of Queensland in Australia. So as Pak Irfan says, we have two international speakers. Udiana, um, I guess you're close to lunchtime at the moment. Udi is focusing on language ideology, social change, and media representation. And our third speaker today is um, one of our homegrown speakers. Jessica is a faculty member of Venus University's English department, and she is actually the assistant head of the department here. She is currently pursuing her doctoral degree at the University of Indonesia. So today, let's hear from um, the, our, the experiences and thoughts of these speakers about studying for um, PhD. So, Ms. Yuseva, um, let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. Uh, let me share my uh, screen. Okay, so thank you, Mr. David, for the introduction and good morning, man. I would like to thank Binus University, uh, Dr. Irfan Rifai, for the invitation to share and learn together in Kijang Academic Sharing uh, Series webinar number four, right? Okay, so, um, oh, wait a minute. So uh, whenever people ask me to share my academic journey, I feel like I open my album. But of course, it is not a photo album, but an album of treasure, I would say. So that is why my slide template is like an album. I hope my album will be a little bit useful for today webinar participants. Uh, Dr. Rifai uh, told me that the targeted audience today will be uh, the first and third semester students of English studies, right? Yeah, so um, actually I'm not really going to talk about a PhD first. <laughs> so I would like to share probably a little bit about my academic since I was a student, undergrad student and up to now. Okay, so my name is Yusefa Iswandari. Uh, Wardana, my last name in the poster actually is my um, Facebook name, uh, the, and that's my husband's last name. So yeah, my name is Yusefa Iswandari, and I am a faculty member of Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta, and I'm in the United States uh, right now, and it's almost 11 p.m. here. Okay, so today I'm going to share my academic journey in English studies. Okay, so uh, there are four subtopics I would like to share. First, uh, find your why and be committed. And second, challenges and efforts. And third, personal development skills. And fourth, professional development. So um, 
once I was a student like you, and also said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And when I look back, this is where I began my very first step. The photo is where I am from. So I was born in a village in the southern part of Bantul, Yogyakarta, and spent my 17 years old literally in that village. Never went out of that village. My father was a security in a bookshop and my mom is a midwife. So born and grew up in the village, I never had any dreams to even go to college or learn English. So I was not exposed to English medium and internet access to see the world outside of me. So I crossed that bridge every day. Um, this is a little bit about me. I was born in a village. I am right now a faculty member at the English Language Education Study Program of Sanata Dharma University. I graduated from that study program. I took my master's degree uh, program at Arizona State University under Fulbright Scholarship. And then I was the director of English Extension course uh, from 2015 to 2019. And I was uh, the co-founder of Indonesian Extensive Reading Association. And I am right now a PhD student at the Ohio State University under Dick Fade Fulbright and the Ohio State University Fellowship. Um, if you see, actually nothing is really special uh, because I believe that many other people are more um, successful and have more achievements, I would say. But for me, this is very special because I began my academic journey from this. I hated English so much. I graduated from senior high school. My father forced me to register myself to program study Bahasa Inggris Universitas Sanata Dharma because he wanted me to be Guru Bahasa Inggris. So yes, English teaching program was actually not a major that I wanted. It was my father probably seeing English as a pathway uh, to new opportunities um, who made me pursue that field. I resented this demand, but I eventually complied knowing that I had no other choice. So yes, it was a nightmare and I struggled a lot. But then I was lucky to have met such a great teacher. His name is Bapak Gunawan and he was my academic advisor. So from him, I learned that the most important thing to do before we decide our journey is to find our why. And as Michael Hyatt mentioned, when you know your why, you'll know your way. So then um, here are my whys. First, of course, my parents. I decided to work as hard as I could, not giving up because I wanted to make them happy. Not proud of me, actually, just happy. My second why is commitment to my choice. I had chosen to follow what my father wanted, even though I didn't like it in the beginning. Um, then I had to be responsible with my choice. And also because my parents were not rich, so I didn't want to waste their money. I had to graduate and grow better in the place where I was. And the next three whys, I actually learned from the Jesuit uh, values in Sanata Dharma University so that my study should be for the development of professional potential to help others, especially those in need and not as fortunate as me, and to pay forward in the future. So yes, after I could find my wise, I feel that I could know my way to survive and to have great endurance. So yes, then um, I still face challenges during my undergraduate study, especially with my English, but then I came with efforts. Challenges, no longer my uh, excuses, and I prefer to focus on solution. So I started to read extensively to improve my grammar and vocabulary. 
and also practice my speaking through extensive listening and viewing. Um, I guess you are more fortunate because you have abundant access to a lot of good listening sources right now, uh, considering that internet is very easy. Not only that, I actively participated in English competitions. Did I ever win any competitions? No, at all. But it didn't matter for me. What matters the most was that I could improve my English. I also started to become an uh, um, English tutor since I was in semester four. I was not good yet, but I took risks and tried hard to be a good teacher. Looking at my efforts, I came to realize that personal development skills um, are very important so that we can strive to be better. So personal uh, development skills are skills that we need to enable us to set personal future goals and visions so that we can achieve personal empowerment. There are actually a lot of skills, but for me, these uh, six most important skills to help define personal qualities. So the first one is interpersonal, uh, social skills that help us interact with other people. Communication, which is related to our ability to write, uh, speak, and also listen. And then self-confidence that help, help us to believe in ourselves and take risks in a positive way, of course. And adaptability, which makes us adapt quickly and easily to any situations, uh, good and bad. Integrity, I think it's very important because it will lead us to opportunity because we have good reputation. And the last one is problem solving, which will help us to focus more on solution. So the, these personal development skills uh, really helped me to set my personal development uh, goals and to reach my full potential. How do I improve my personal development skills? So first, I tried to overcome my fear because I knew that fear could prevent me from growing and also progressing. I took risks and then went out of my comfort zone. As a wise man said that growth and comfort do not coexist. So you have to choose whether you want to be in the comfort zone or you want to grow. So uh, the second one, I read a lot because reading uh, could expand our knowledge and also improve our critical thinking. And then third, networking by interacting with people and then joining organization, community, and also competition. And the fourth, I observe and learn from others, um, including inspiring people that I always looked up to. I also reflect a lot by asking feedback from my friends and also from uh, lecturers. I also kept uh, a journal um, and I wrote every day like by the end of the day. And the next one, I tried to find growth buddy and I spent time with them, uh, not gossiping, but trying to <laughs> like, you know, give uh, some suggestions and then try to motivate each other and grow better with them. Uh, what is important is consistency. Like if you want to improve your personal development skills, you have to really be consistent in doing those six. So that's what I was doing. In addition, I was also very disciplined with time management. I followed Stephen Covey's time management metric, and I think this metric will help you a lot, especially today, where you have um, more challenges from social media and online activities. So I always categorize my activity into four quadrants, uh, urgent and important. It's like your deadline, your assignments, that is urgent and important, not urgent, but important. Um, it's like uh, your professional development or your personal development, something like that. And then uh, urgent but not important. And then not urgent and not important. So the last quadrant is where actually the social media and TikTok and all of uh, their friends are. Yeah, so not urgent and then not important. So you can just avoid it 
or maybe you can just try to put aside. And in terms of profession to pursue, so like what I want to be in the future when I was a student, I was trying to also explore since I was a student. So I tried to be a translator, interpreter, news anchor, uh, but then I, I didn't really feel that it's my patient. So from my exploration journey, I found my patient uh, that is being a teacher. So my suggestion for you, uh, maybe you can start to explore your potential profession from now and consider any jobs that will continue to be uh, in demand in the future. As now I already graduated and work, I continue to develop myself professionally by continuing my study. So I'm taking a PhD at the moment. I am actually 41 years old right now. Uh, I have a daughter, 10 years old. But yes, I still have big motivation to continue my study because I think um, Life is a learning process, a never ending learning process. So yeah, I continue uh, my education and I also researching. And I think Mr. David already mentioned like my uh, research interests. And why extensive reading? Because I find a lot of benefits from doing extensive reading, both uh, academically and non-academically. So extensive reading basically is reading extensively every day like reading any books that you like. So instead of, um, I don't know, instead of spending time in social media 24 seven, then probably you can try to read because that will Im really improve your uh, English. And I already experienced that. You should try. I also actively attend conferences nationally, internationally, and also I uh, join professional organization. Um, these are just the examples, so the three of them. Um, because I experience benefits of extensive reading, I and my colleague uh, Ibu Mita from Sanata Dharma University established the Indonesian Extensive Reading Association uh, and this is the first uh, extensive reading association in Indonesia where actually Dr. Irfan and Dai become uh, the board members there. And the main purpose is to introduce the concept of English extensive reading and promote it to English uh, teachers and students at universities and schools. And our main activities are creating a place for sharing and discussion through Facebook group and regular free um, AR workshops and activities. And also we've been conducting uh, webinars for AR and Dr. Irfan was one of the keynote speakers in Sanata Dharma University chapter. Is that right, uh, Dr. Irfan? Yeah. And the second one is helping schools setting up AR program and also providing reading sources. And the third one is conducting research, not only uh, with other lecturers, but also students actually. So if you're interested, you can uh, join IERA and then we can have like a joint research between lecturer and also students. On session of excerpt about uh, IERA or yeah, IERA, uh, you can go to IERA official website or joining our IERA Facebook group. Or if you want to know more about the benefits of extensive reading, you can ask Dr. Irfan to have another webinar on it. Okay. <laughs> so then, uh, yeah, as I reflect back to my journey, it is surely my whys actually that have driven my personal and professional development as well as my career. So yeah, it's all about the why. I think what is important is like, now you are in your undergrad uh, stage, right? In undergrad time. So I think what is important for you now is really trying to find your whys. Why are you um, in Bina Nusantara University? Why are you taking English studies? So find your whys first, and then I'm sure you are going to find your way in the future. 
So have a great journey finding your why. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yusefa. That was great and inspiring um, story from you. And I hope that has inspired everyone to really work hard and get more success. Just one little personal story I've got for you, actually, Yusefa. Um, one of your um, previous students saw our webinar poster and she approached me. She said, ah, oh, Mr. David, you're moderating a webinar today with Ibu Yuseva. She was my lecturer. I remember her very well. So you've obviously had a long-term impact on your students as well. So well done. The, the name was Reynaldis. Um, but you, obviously, we have so many students, it's not, you may, may or may not remember. I remember um, her. Okay, yes, we all like Reynaldis um, anyway. Okay, lovely. Hi. Thank you for your great talk there. So, our next speaker is um, Udiana. Udi, are you ready? Yeah, thank you, David. All right, so over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Buyu Saifa. That was really um, so positive. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to thank you to Paifan for giving me a chance to, to be in this event. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to share about, I'm, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, a lot about my journey, but more on like for um, these students, for those who aspire to be in academia or like work as a uh, in an academic career so I was just like to give some insight of how it is and how to get here and yeah some of those things wait let me scare, share my screen but that was given by uh Bu Yuseva. it was so positive but uh, this this one is like quite different you'll see so yeah um I'm Udiana Puspadewi I'm from uh, English department uh, BINUS and uh, currently I am taking um uh, taking a leave for my study here uh, as a PhD student in University of Queensland, um, studying linguistic anthropology. So uh, uh, there's few, yeah. So now you see the problem. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I I will talk about who I am, why am I here, what does it mean to be here, to be in academia, and how to get here, and where to go from here. So it's like um, more on like giving the. Uh, insight to the students of how it is and what it is to, uh, to be an academia. So, um, yeah, so I will just going to like briefly talk about uh, who I am and why I'm studying English. So yeah, here's uh, my journey. So I was um, starting from a very small town. Actually, it's close to uh, Bu Yosefa hometown. I'm, um, Bu Yosefa was from Jogja. Yeah, right. You were mentioning you're from Jogja and I'm from Solo. And then uh, both my parents are lecturers. So, um, and then they're studying um, Sastra Indonesia. So somehow like I got a lot of influence from them and thinking that academic career is like one of my aspiration. So I was taking English department because um, I tried to come up with motivational reason, but really though, the, the only reason is that English is the only thing I'm good at when I was in high school. So it's not like I have a lot of options. <laughs> so yeah, English department. Uh, and, and also because of my parents as well, um, they, they're studying Sastra Indonesia. And also like I saw how they do things as an academia. Uh, academia so I was like uh, in some way aspired. So yeah, I decided to uh, to uh, enroll for English department in Sebelas Maret University. Uh, it's a university in Solo. And the only, re uh, the, the reason why I took that university was because I don't have to leave my hometown. So I just can like stay in Solo while studying English department there. And then um, they have like four options at that time, uh, which, which is different from um, what we have in Binus, which more professional, uh, professional streaming in Binus. In ONS, uh, we had American study, translation, literature, and linguistics. And I decided to um, take linguistic because um, I, I think I got a lot of influence from my, uh, from my father because he was studying linguistic as well. So at least I have someone to consult to when I'm like finding some difficulties working on my assignment. So that's another reason. So I, I'm taking linguistics. But then, uh, during the first three years in the department, uh, I haven't got like 
uh, the decision yet, like I'm thinking about linguistic, but all the social thing that I learned from the American study class and also from literature class, we learned a lot of social things that actually um, very interesting. So then I am like, um, I decided like, okay, I'm taking linguistic, but then I have to like learn more on um, social things. That's why when I'm um, graduating, I then decided to um, study social linguistics. So it's a bit like the mixture of sociology and linguistics where I can learn both. Like I still learn all the social aspect and cultural aspect of the language. At the same time, I'm still using uh, the linguistic, uh, the, the, the thing that I learned from my undergraduate. And then uh, I took my uh, master degree in University of Essex, UK, taking social linguistic. And then um, it was, I think the scholarship doesn't exist anymore right now. So it was from um, Dikti, Dia Siswa Talon Dosen. I think I'm the last, I'm the last, um, the last group of uh, student who got that scholarship. And after that, they, they, they don't have this scholarship anymore for a master degree. So yeah, I'm taking um, the social linguistics. So I'm studying social linguistic in Essex. And then after that, um, I'm coming back to Indonesia and um, joining uh, Binus as the faculty member and the subject content coordinator uh, in linguistics, where I learned a lot uh, about what does it mean to be in academia in a, in a real life. Because like, I always aspired to be in academia, but uh, the picture that I had in my head at that time was like, I'm going to learn about uh, like being a researcher and uh, being uh, like curriculum development, but then uh, when you're actually joining a uh, university, like there are lots, lots of things that um, outside those things. Like um, I'm going to uh, explain about that uh, later in the slides. But yeah, I learned a lot from uh, being a faculty member in a business university, and now I'm um, doing my PhD in linguistic anthropology in University of Queensland, and also I um, I'm becoming an academic staff, a casual academic staff here, and helping my supervisor to uh, do a mentoring and uh, having a class for, for undergraduate student and also uh, working on the curriculum def development and doing uh, be a, becoming a research assistant. So yeah, uh, all those things that I learned in BINUS is like very useful as well while, uh, when I finally move here and become a PhD student. Okay, um, yeah, so this is what I'm doing right now basically. So other than being a PhD student um, in Indonesian department, oh, and my research, by the way, is um, about Japanese language. So despite taking um, English department as my undergraduate and then like on a social linguistic, I took my, um, my master degree in UK. And now here I'm um, doing my PhD under Indonesian department because I'm working on Japanese language. So yeah, the, this is what I'm doing right now, um, becoming a PhD student in Indonesian department and then becoming an uh, academic staff in School of Language and Culture, also under Indonesian department. Uh, I work as a casual academic staff working on the development of um, cu uh, curriculum and then revising teaching material, also a research assistant working on the grant with my supervisor. Uh, and then also I become a volunteer uh, to give a mentoring session for the undergraduate student, uh, Australian student who wants to study about Indonesian and who, uh, who's going to do an exchange to Indonesia. So yeah, this is what I'm doing. And then uh, next, yeah, so this is why I'm studying linguistic. Uh, this is why I'm here basically because I like to do a research, uh, what I learned in my undergraduate, uh, the research culture that they give me. So I studied in Sebelas Marut University where like most of the project are, um, most of the courses, we are required to help like small project and it like really give me an inspiration to do more and more research. And I think in Indonesia, one of the way to be a researcher is by becoming, uh, becoming a lecturer in a university. So, that's one of the reasons. And uh, when I explain to people I'm studying linguistic, it's, um, it's quite hard to explain that to people, right? So I was trying, yeah. So this is some of, uh, I found this uh, somewhere in Reddit. <laughs> so when I tell people that I'm studying linguistic, this is what they think. Like, so my friend thinks I'm a grammar Nazi, a Nazi where like they suddenly very conscious of what they're saying around me because um, they think I'm going to judge them or something like that. And then 
what my, my parents think, like when I want to be a researcher in Indonesia, they were like, um, look at us. <laughs> so like, it's like, it's not something that, that is promising, like uh, compared to other jobs. And then what society think, like when I say I'm a linguist, they think that I can speak many languages. Like I speak three languages and I'm not fluent in all of them. So <laughs> that's, that's a thing. And then uh, what people from natural science think, um, yeah, and then this is Chomsky, by the way. So Chomsky is like social, um, the person who like have a very strong influence in social linguistic. So it's like very inspiring. And this is I know some of the students who joined me in Sons of English class, they probably like <laughs> know this um, Powell and all this syntax thing. Like, yeah. So this is what do people have in their mind where they hear, uh, when, they, when I said to them that I'm a linguist. But um, so what actually have, uh, what I'm studying now is um, anthropolinguistic. So basically it's different uh, linguistic or linguistic anthropology, which basically is different from um, what they had in mind. So I don't like judge people for, from the way they talk. It's like I'm, I'm observing more on the language valuing. So in my master degree, I was studying about social linguistic uh it was observed uh, the focus was observing the real language the systemic use of language by social actors and then authentic context but now um so this is like the brief summary of the difference of social linguistic and linguistic anthropology like now i'm studying more on the ideology so the the main idea is that we have to view language as a natural things that no language is better than any other language no accent is better than any other accent that everything is similar, but what makes the difference is the social context, our uh, way of valuing the ideology that we have. So that's what I actually studying right now. I'm, I'm observing more on why people observe or valuing one language better than other language, why people judge the way people talk, why people value certain ac accent better than other people accent. So that's, uh, that's my focus. I don't, I'm not a grammar Nazi. Uh, I don't really care about what people say the way they say it. So if in case some of you still have no um, idea of what linguists do, not all of them are grammar Nazis. Some of them are, but <laughs> not all of them. Yeah, so that's, this is what basically uh, I'm studying. I'm studying linguistic anthropology. So it's more on the way people value the language instead of judging the way they talk. And then um, this is some of the example of what uh, linguistic anthropology looks like. So we describe things, we don't prescribe. Oh, what many people or many linguists do is like they prescribing like a, like a doctor giving a prescription. This is how you should, uh, this is how you should pronounce something. This is how you should talk. This is how you should um, uh, say something. But in linguistic anthropology, we saw that all of those things are political. It's a social construct. And I don't, I don't tell people how to say things or how, uh, how they should sound like. So that's what we're doing in social linguistic anthropology. We observe the judgment. We don't observe uh, the language. So yeah, that's a brief summary of what um, I'm studying. Where now I'm talking about, yeah. So for some of you, um, the students who are here and aspire to be an academy, uh, academia in Indonesia or outside Indonesia, this is several things that you may want to have uh, to uh, some insight that you probably need to hear that um, it's like living two coins, like you want to be a researcher, you want to be an academia, you want to develop uh, your, um, you want to, yeah, you want to participate and um, con contribute for the, the field, but at the same time, you have the responsibility for the university to do an um, administrative stuff so yeah this is one of the picture uh when i was working in Venus, i thought it's like it was only in indonesia that we have to do an administrative life but then here as well even though like somehow here it's more connected like when you're doing an administrative stuff uh, or task it's somehow related with your academia life so uh the pro is like you can work whenever you want every day uh, it's saturday but then also, you work on Saturday because like it's endless. So it's like part of your life, especially when you're a PhD student, like there's no day passing by without thinking what you have to do because like everything is keep, keeps, uh, like it's always in your mind, whether like it's weekend or not, like <laughs> it's nonstop. 
it's a life. So it's not a job. It's not life. It's a life <laughs> somehow. Like uh, yeah. So this is the two uh, sides of academia life. So in academia life, we have like the responsibility to teach, to research, and to do a community development, which somehow related. And this is the ideal world that we don't live in. <laughs> I mean, uh, the 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 other side of the academy is that mm, like few of us actually know because we have to do a collaboration as well. As a researcher, you may you can have your own research, but if you don't collaborate, you don't like disseminate the result of your research, you don't talk to people about your research, then it's stuck there. Nobody's going to know your research. So collaboration is like something that you have to do whether you like it or not. And then quality management, like you have to revise your pitching material, you have to check whether everything goes according to plan. And then uh, curriculum development, and then the ETCs we don't talk about because like there are so many of them that maybe for um for the student who aspire to be in academia like this uh this thing on the left side or on the right side many of them didn't know that this thing exists but yeah it's basically how to be in academia it's like you're living two sides of the coin being in academia and be living an administrative life and it's like it's it's not like you have the option like you have to like deal with both yeah so that's like briefly how uh, academia life looks like and how to get here so i probably because i know the audience is going to be like many of them are students so for those who want to be in academia uh, i try to like give some insight of what they can do don't mind the picture it was just try to dramatize <laughs> it's not that hard but <laughs> yeah it was just yeah so post graduating yeah that's like uh the i don't think you can be a lecturer if you're if you don't continue your study so post graduating is like one of the thing that uh, a must uh, there's two things that I wish I knew before I start my master degree is that you can take master by course or take master by research. If you want to do a PhD, I suggest you to take master by research because what I didn't know at that time and I didn't have some anyone to talk about this and many people who has no idea, they just like take the easy way by taking master by course and little did I know uh, when you're graduating from master by course, you don't you don't have to write a master dissertation but when you're continuing to your phd then uh, when you're try when you try to apply they will ask your uh, research experience and i was lucky because i once i finished my master by course i joined venus university where i have to like do a lot of publication and do a research so that somehow helped me to get a phd position here but some for some of those who like want to right away continue their master degree to their PhD and they took master by course, then they will have a problem of um, getting a PhD position. So reconsider this before you're taking your um, postgraduate. Uh, like if you want to continue uh, your PhD, then I suggest you to take ma master by course because like here we offer a lot of position, PhD position for those who's, who's taking master by course because we don't have to like invite people to, um, to join us. They, we just like offer anyone who is already taking those uh, master by course. So yeah, this is the two, maybe two things that you need, you want to consider before you continue your study. Uh, depends on what your aspiration, if you want to be in academia, then maybe master by course is one of the option that, that is better than master by course. And then next, yeah, uh, some insight of getting a scholarship. Yeah, so for, for those of you, uh, for you who, want to be uh, an academia, you want to get a scholarship. This is a few things. Uh, I think Bu Yusefa already covered a lot of these things before. Uh, she, she, she did this, um, like making the priority, the scale of priority and like um, joining competition and then also um, uh, joining many things that build your CV. So building your CV is very important. So the first one is like taking your IL test or IBT because later it's going to be useful. It, it's like a must. So you have to have at least one of those and, this, and then build your CV. I, I wasn't joining a lot of organization when I was in undergraduate. Uh, and then what I did was writing. So I like, like um, I write and write and write because that's at least something, there must be something in your CV that will, uh, that will help you to get a university or getting a scholarship. So if you're not the organization kind of person, writing can be an option or joining competition as well, that can be an option. But the main thing is like you have to build your CV. 
and then use your last two semester in uni to prepare the scholarship requirement. If you're like actually planning to take master degree right away after you graduate, then um, the last two semester is really uh, significant to um, like getting an information about scholarship, uh, getting to know where you want to go and what the requirement that you have to fill. Uh, those those two last semester is really essential uh, unless you plan to work first and getting more experience then you don't have to do it in the last two semester but if you want to do it right away use your two last semester for this like checking is your um, IELTS enough is your CV good enough uh, have you write enough so yeah this is the few uh, thing that you m may want to check before you um, applying for a scholarship and then uh, yeah, this is the several scholarship that you can apply. Those are the popular scholarship, the um, LPDP, of course. Uh, uh, I think LPDP, like, you have to have, like, at least, like, um, involvement in a social community or organization. Uh, and then Fulbright as well. I think we just have already ex explained the Fulbright. And then Australian Awards. Erasmus also, if you want to go to Europe. Fulbright if you want to go to America and then Australian award if you want to go to Australia but there's this some less popular scholarship I wish I knew and um, there's this uh, research um, research uh, what do they call it research training uh, program so it's like um, you are recruited to be a researcher so we like giving a training for uh, people who like uh, first graduate they have a program for master for uh, Master uh, of Research and also PhD. So you may want to check that out. Uh, I think it's it's very common in Australia, and uh, because it's less popular, so you compete like with less people. So it's like, uh, that, but the main thing is like you have to publish before you actually you have to at least publish in certain journal before you apply for this. But I wish people told me about this because it's uh, you don't like to have to compete with a lot of people, especially when you're from um, language uh, uh, from if you're studying language yeah. And then university base, you can also go to their website and check if they're having some um, scholarship provided by the university. Oh, and then one thing, um, you can check the, profe uh, the professor profile, try to find what they're doing and try to write a proposal uh, based on their interest because most likely they have a project that will require a student, whether it's a um, master student or PhD student to be part of that project. So if you're having similar interest with that person, then you, you would likely be recruited as, uh, as the student. And then Endeavor as well. And then uh, BPL, BPPL and NBUDI, that's actually for a lecturer. So if somehow you already take your master degree and then you can like, enroll in certain university in Indonesia to, and then you have the NIDN, Nomor Induk Dosen Nasional, you can enroll this this two scholarship. So that's some insight on scholarship. Uh, and then this is, uh, do I still have time, David? Sorry. I still have time. Yeah, okay, okay. So yeah, this is some insight of uh, me studying in two different countries. Um, for some of you who decide where to go, uh, what I learned is that when I'm studying in United Kingdom, the process like there's more cultural exposure because it's completely different from Indonesia and then more, more country to visit. It's, it doesn't mean like you're like traveling around. It's more like the networking that when you have to go for certain conferences uh, to different university, you get more connection um, and more different country to, to visit for a conference and for, for a collaboration. But the cons is like the return ticket is expensive because it's far and then less part-time working opportunities, at least in UK, I, don't, I, I think, we were only allowed to work for 20 hours a week. Eh, sorry. Yeah, 20 hours, but here it's more flexible in Australia. And then the, the weather is very depressing. It's cold. It's, it's raining all day. So for Indonesian people who get used to all the sunshine and all the heat, it will be very depressing. And then they don't have like a bridging visa. So once your study finished, you have to leave right away. But in Australia, you have bridging visa where like you can extend your visa and like have a year here to get a job here if you want to stay. So yeah, that's the Australia one. Um, the pros is like more time working opportunities like uh, my visa uh, doesn't limit me uh, to not working. So I can work up to 40 hours for the, for the university. So it's, uh, it's really beneficial. Like the, the visa here is really flexible compared to the one in Europe. 
and then you have bridging visa so if you actually want to stay here and work here then you can apply for that and you you got a year to actually figure out whether you want to continue phd after you finish your master or whether you want to come back to indonesia you can apply for the bridging visa and then traits and weather as well like the characteristic of the people in australia are very similar with those in indonesia and then the weather as well it's just like it's it feels like you're just taking a study in bali you know like it's similar <laughs> so yeah less culture shock as well yeah and then uh, the country is like less country to visit because it like it, it uh, it's a whole big continent you don't actually get an exposure from a uh, university outside the australia i think like new zealand is the only like possible place you can visit or you can like have in conference or network with but other than that it's too, it's too far and less cultural exposure because the culture are almost similar with Indonesian and then like you meet uh, yeah everyone that you meet are either Asian or Australian and like you don't meet other people from different continents too often I mean it's different from in Europe and then where to go from here so I was talking about dealing with opportunities when you're like taking your master degree and then um, finish with that what are you going to do whether you're gonna be in academia in Indonesia or staying here or taking your PhD here and deciding to be faculty member in one of international university so yeah so the endless question of life staying or leaving so dealing with the opportunities that you get while doing um, what happened to me in, when I was in UK I got an offer um, from the uh, it was poly, police Acad police academy some some kind like that because I'm studying linguistic and they're looking for uh, the offering scholarship for for uh, lingu forensic linguistic, but you have to like take another master degree and then you have to work for the police department right after you graduate. But then at that time I was taking the BSC Talon Dosen where I required to go back to Indonesia after I finished my study, so I couldn't take that chance. So that's that's one thing that you have to consider before taking your scholarship. So the, the first thing is like, you know what you want. You know wh whether you want to go back to Indonesia, having a career in Indonesia, or you want to be in, uh, to stay there or get a job there. So that's the first thing that you have to decide before deciding to take any scholarship or going to any university. And then make your scale of priority, whether uh, you want to be in academia or you want to work outside the academia world. So it's also uh, will affect your decision or taking master by course or master by research because yeah if you want to be academia then you have to do more uh, publication uh, academia stuff and then work hard not work smart being pragmatics any day of the week and idealism kills you uh, that's the thing that actually we got here um uh we have the tra tra training for the phd student to kill our idealism because it will really slow things down you know so like just that's why i'm talking about scale of priority so you don't actually being very idealistic about what you're doing but get job get the job down and then like revisit of those things to revise but um yeah be, uh, the main things like being from pragmatics any any day of the week and then that's that that last part i tried to come up with more positive thing but suffering in silence means like um i try to say striving but striving sounds so cheesy <laughs> it's like just keep on trying to do things you're not the only one who's struggling so that's why I like just just do things make all the lists checked and you don't have to like um whining a lot because it doesn't solve anything so that's what i mean by suffering inside and i'll try to come up with more positive things <laughs> and then yeah so this is what i already said before carry opportunity as academia in indonesia or here uh ask yourself before choosing scholarship if you actually decided to uh, have a career here which is very possible because i met a lot of people here who are Indonesian and they are full uh, full time faculty faculty member in Australian University also back in UK. So it is possible for you if you decide to want to have a career as an academia outside Indonesia. So before actually step taking your first step, then you have to decide what what you want and make your scale of priority. I think that's all from me. Hope it gives you an insight of what it is to be an academia. David, I guess back to you <laughs> okay lovely thank you very much udi and again it was um, a great a great um, explanation lots of specific advice and things to think about for um, anyone who's interested in following 
a um, career in academics. So lots of interesting stuff there. And I think it was positive, actually. There was nothing negative. Apart from the UK weather, Udi, how can you say the weather is depressing? Right, it's depressing. <laughs> I didn't know, nobody told me that, so I didn't prepare myself yeah. for it to be That's that depressing. All, all these all these British people are going crazy with this lockdown <laughs> stuff because we can't go to Spain or anywhere hot at the moment. Right. <laughs> okay, lovely. So thank you for that great um, talk there, Udi. And now we have um, to turn to our third presenter. And um, Jesse, over to you. Thank you, David. Wow, wow, wow. Bu Yusefa and Bu Udiana. It's a... Uh... It's very enriching. I think I took the journey part rather literally. <laughs> so here you go. <laughs> and I have to agree that the uh, the weather is depressing, David. Uh, uh, we yeah. never talk about the weather here in Indonesia because it's always either shiny or rainy. But in the UK, every day, weather is like the topic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is it showing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so thank you for the time. Good afternoon, everyone, or almost afternoon. Um, so here I am. Um, I'm going to talk about um, my journey in pursuing this academic career. Uh, have I ever thought of being one? Never have I ever. But um, so this is Oh, what it is. Uh, that's why I called my presentation by, you know, Miss Jessie and, and I called Miss Jessie as an alter ego uh, of mine, uh, the other identity uh, that I uh, gain or received as I pursuing this uh, academic career journey. Uh, so let me introduce myself again. My name is Crescencia Jessica Stiadi. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, well, that's not me. Yes, that's more like it. Um, <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to just show the, you know, the relevant bit about, uh, about myself. Uh, I, uh, this is my educational background. Um, so I did my undergrad in English literature in Binan Central University. So I'm an alumni in Sastra Inggris Binus. Uh, from 2006 to 2010. Uh, I was uh, one of the first trackers as well, and uh, that's like, I'm very, very glad that uh, it's the first time ever that the fast track or three and a half year uh, graduating is open for the students. Um, and I will tell you the reason why later on. Uh, and then after that, I'm pursuing my grad school in also in English literature, but more specific in modern and contemporary fictions and at the University of Westminster from 2014 to 2016. Um, um, this is what I wish I knew before I entering a uh, master's degree is that uh, whether it is that you are, you want to pursue English lit, uh, each university offer a different kind of approach to what English literature, uh, where they are. And then, uh, but in the University of Westminster that I apply, they're offering in modern and counter fictions, maybe some other universities offer different, you know, uh, pathways in that sense. Uh, but I didn't regret it. Uh, I really enjoyed studying there. And then the last is my postgrad, uh, where I'm doing right now um, in, at the University of Indonesia, also in literature. So as you can see here, um, usually in the academic journey, you um, you are asked or uh, you are expected to be more linear or having linearity in your study. Uh, so that's why I think, um, well, I don't know whether this is by chance or um, I'm actually trying to see, uh, seem that I'm planning it out, but uh, I did my English uh, undergrad, grad, and postgrad all in literature. Um, yeah, so that's that, a little bit about me. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll be talking about, you know, past, present, and future, you know, being from the literature uh, field, I think this is more a linear or a narrative structure of, you know, 
uh, start, a middle, and end. Uh, so that's why I'm be talking about past, present, and future. Where in the past, I'm talking about why Sastra Inggris. I think that's just the questions that has been always popping up uh, from the society in general, or from parents, or from prospective students. On uh, hopefully not from from you. <laughs> and then now, uh, and then next is how when it did it start rolling as in it as in this journey of mine. And then next, I'll be talking about. Uh, present time uh, about working and schooling that I'm doing right now and then a little bit of future of my short-term goals and long-term goals okay so why is Sastra Inggris um, well this is just the I don't know hopefully this is a rhetoric right uh, but um, why Sastra Inggris has been like ongoing questions uh, and then if, uh, if we talk about uh, okay, where where are you studying, or what 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 is your major? And then you talk about you know English lit, and then you uh, the same goes like linguistics. People are thinking that you are uh, you read a lot. You know Shakespeare. That's like uh, the very basic uh, the, oh, understanding about people. And then or in Indonesia, a lot of people think oh you're learning the language, uh, you know um, in general. But I. Pursue Sastra Inggris, uh, I think because at the early age, a lot, um, I think myself and my family always see that that I pick up language easily. I love languages, uh, not only English. I learn Mandarin, I learn Japanese, I learn Korean. Um, I learn a little bit of German when I was a kid, but that's just because I love learning a new language and I love learning about the culture and I pick it up very easily i can just watch a lot of dramas uh you know in a certain period of time and i just i can pick up many words and the grammar and then i i can um re oh, what is it uh, i can also do the accents and pronunciation very well uh, but i'm not sure if, whether it's correct because i never enrolled for any courses but i love languages in that sense um, and then when I was about to enter college, uh, because my love for languages, my parents were like, okay, uh, why don't you, you know, pick, you know, pick up some majors in language. And then uh, because Venus is uh, around the corner of my house, and then also my brother are, has already been in Venus uh, at that time. Um, so the, the at the time, there is a faculty of letters and they're offering English, Japanese, and Chinese uh, literature. And I was like, I don't know which one what I want, but I was thinking at the time because, you know, uh, I, as a youngster, you're thinking, oh my God, the thesis would be in the language. So I won't be able to write academic, uh, you know, thesis in Japanese or Chinese. Uh, I, I know a little bit of English. So, and so I, I, uh, I pick English and also having the realizations that at the time in 2006, English is uh, rather, you know, it's still like um, the importance of English um, is still high um, um, at the time. So, um, so yeah, I enrolled English because for the love of it um, and then also um, I realized that um, having this second language or, you know, at least um, be proficient at uh, a, a second language is important. And at its time, English is like the global language. Uh, um, yeah. Um, and then uh, in Minus, uh, I, I really enjoy, uh, you can see that the uh, my undergraduate study is the happiest time that I've ever spent uh, because at that time I get to basically in, in Sastra Inggris I get to learn anything everything that I like uh, so I enjoy all subjects <laughs> and then uh, by enjoying those subjects or by enjoying you know your study uh, you get to also be motivated in getting the scholarship uh, and I'm also having um, studying uh, for me and my brother at least at home because we're coming from a like social economic background we are uh, studying um, for us is a burden 
is burdensome. So we we are motivated in that way in gaining the in getting the scholarships uh, every semester that Binus offered at the time. I think it, Binus also offered the same thing as per today. Uh, is is you know is where the motivations come from for for us to finish our study and enjoy our study and graduate with flying colors. I think I think that's it. Uh, for why Sister Angus to me uh, personally. Uh, so yeah, so moving on to when, how this it started. It all started when, this is the birth of Miss Jessie, my alter ego. I've never been called Miss Jessie before, uh, not until I begin my teaching journey. Uh, I believe, you know, a lot of you also probably experienced the same thing uh, because this is like the uh, the address that you would you would get when you are uh, teaching here in Indonesia, right? Um, so this is the very uh, first questions that popped uh, to me by a classmate. Um, she she was teaching in a, in an English course, and then she asked me, "I need to resign. Do you want to sub me?" And I was like, "What?" Never have I ever again. I've never thought of, about teaching. I do love sharing. We every time before exams with my with my classmates, we always share. You know what we learn in class, just to have a little bit of ref, re, review about the subjects. But you know, being paid of teaching, and it, my head is like there's just a lot of what if. What if I couldn't answer the, this kid's questions? What if I gave off the wrong you know, uh, or incorrect informations and so on and so on. So there's just a lot of what ifs at the time uh, because I wasn't sure about this path. Uh, at the time, I'm already at my 10th year, my 10th year of doing stage performance. So I was thinking that I'm going to be an actress or I'm going to be um, a TV presenter because I'm also already been uh, airing on TV uh, one year at the, at the time as well. So this is like a new pathways that I've never thought of. Um, and then I asked around uh, and then one of the lecturers, I asked my friends who were teaching, I asked my lecturers, of course, and then one of them said, just try it first, see if you like it. If you don't, you just get out. Uh, and then so, yeah, oh, what, what do I have to lose? So I did uh, the interview. Um, so yeah, at the fifth semester of my undergraduate study, Miss Jessie was born. Um, and then that's my, my first gig, one of my first gigs uh, teaching, teaching English for kids at 12,500 rupiahs per hour. <laughs> I didn't have the idea of how much, you know, they, they paid for, uh, for, and David was like, oh, that's just a little bit less than a, a little bit over than a half a pound. Um, and then, um, but at the time I don't have, I don't have, I didn't have the, uh, the idea how much teachers getting paid. And so, so I didn't ask around uh, because it's a rather sensitive issue. Um, so I just, you know, created a mindset. Okay. It's fine. I earn small, but I learn big. Uh, so this is like, I think this is what a lot of people or a lot of new or fresh graduate have should have in mind. You will earn small, but uh, you know, on, on, the, on the other hand, you learn big because, so this is like money oriented versus experience oriented and always go for experience oriented because I think experience is priceless. Um, so at least that's the mindset that I created. <laughs> Yeah, um, but so as the conclusion, I worked there for four years and I'm making my way up to 25,000 uh, rupees an hour. So that's like double the price, but you know, it's gradually uh, increasing over the years. But I was very glad that at least at this point, I have four years of experience teaching. Uh, so in and that, and that sense, you know, I'm leveling up. Uh, I, I can write something on my CV uh, in that sense. Uh, and then part two, I don't know if Burisa still remember this, but 
uh, because I've been teaching in the English courses, I begin to have this fun of teaching. I love sharing and I want to, and I and I express my um, keenness uh, for teaching at the university level. I forgot whom that I uh, that I spoke to, but uh, before I just before I graduated, I got this text from Burisa, and then I forgot you know oh, what is it written. But basically, this is the gist: Would you like to teach with us and join the team? And I was like, yes, this is what I've been wanting uh, because teaching in the English course is like somehow, you know, you're dealing with kids, but you know, you know what's coming in the packet with kids, the parents. So, <laughs> so it's sometimes it's rather terrifying to, you know, to meet the parents and, you know, how demanding they are and so on. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, I want to work in a university level where I teach adults, uh, they are their own selves. Um, so I can be more focused on uh, what I'm sharing or what I'm teaching in a sense. Uh, so, so the journey of Miss Jesse from teacher and then I become a lecturer, but at the time I was only a, uh, an undergrad with an undergrad degree. And uh, I can join Venus at the time, uh, but I, could not join the department because I don't have the master's degree, uh, like what Ms. Udi said, right? Um, so I get to work or teach at the university level, but I teach uh, a general English for other departments. So that's basically associate faculty member teaching English for Mata Kuliah Umum or MKU that we call it, and I work under the language center. And this is my first gig. A seven semester, seven semester students, and a class full of seventy students, and what I have to teach is TOEFL, which I've had never taken before. <laughs> so this is crazy because seven semester students means that we only have a a, a year gap apart because I just graduated. Um, so I was, and then the what ifs came again. What if you know they didn't take me seriously? What if they, you, uh, you know, these kids know that I'm only like a year older or probably we're at the same age. Uh, and, you know, uh, mostly because I'm afraid they didn't take me seriously. And I also began to ask around, how do I teach this? Because this is crazy and scary at the same time. Uh, and then one of the lecturers said, again, I asked around and one of the lecturers said, you know what, talk English and talk fast. And so I did. Um, that's why I think that's uh, have been, uh, you know, um, instilled in, in my head and my heart that I always uh, talk in English all the way at, in the classroom. And that's what I think giving a good exposure for the students that I teach. Um, so talk English and talk fast. So this is what my class look like uh, so that's me in the middle sorry that's uh, the picture is rather pixelated but yeah that's uh you know imagine that you just graduated you started teaching TOEFL to these 70 students in one class and that's crazy but in fact uh many of them are i think all of them are now my facebook friends at least and i still you know good friends and uh with some of them uh we're still in touch uh, because you know uh, that's the, also the perks of teaching. You get to meet new people, and that's what I love also about teaching. Um, so, and then the part three, this is like another, you know, level from kids to university students. And now, uh, I was also asked to be, are you interested in teaching English for lectures? But instead of like having the what ifs, and I'm already get tired of it, uh, I changed again the mindset to be, you know what, challenge accepted. Uh, so this is what uh, at least my teaching journey, uh, um, you know, teaching English in general, um, from kids to university students to lecturers. And what matters is just what you know. Um, and what doesn't matter is the age. Uh, and, then, um, and then also what doesn't matter is the what ifs. <laughs> so this is 
uh, my teaching journey. But uh, after that, um, before I move on to the present time, I think um, after four years, uh, after four years teaching in an uh, English course and then two years teaching in uh, at university level, I begin to think of my career in a more sensible way. Uh, I begin. Uh, my my love of teaching kept growing, and then um, so I decided to um, to pursue my master's degree. Uh, so after I finished my grad school, uh, this is where I am right now. I uh, if you I, I did mention that I could not teach or I could not be in the department because I just had the undergraduate degree. But as soon as I uh, finished my graduate degree, I came back to be a nurse and I was, uh, I, and I joined the English department because now that I have my uh, S-Dua degree. So as, well, as soon as I finished my grad school, I joined the English department of, uh, I came back home and then I joined the English department of Bina Nusantara University, which is also my second home um, because I grew up here. Uh, and then, uh, this is what I think Ms. Udiano already mentioned. Uh, it's funny because what I think before I uh, came back from the UK, what I think because I, what I've been doing in becoming a docent or lecturers are teaching. So that's what I thought that, uh, you know, being docent would be teaching. But I think this is uh, need to be clarified as well. Being, being a docent or being a lecturer is not just about teaching. Being a faculty member, if you're already be, you know, admitted to a certain department and then you become the faculty member, you, you are not only teaching, but you also have to community, de community developing. You need to do research and then you also need to, you know, join trainings to, you know, to self-improve yourself. So this is just, this is our the full-time job as a lecturer. So not only teaching, um, but also uh, community development, researching and self-improving. And then on the other hand, there comes the administrative part, which is here with me, uh, uh, as for me, I'm the deputy head of the department. I help running the department with the team. I, this is my administrative work. Uh, what I do is um, closely related, but not necessarily completely related to being what a faculty member is because I'm, uh, you know, working with the schedules of the lecturers and the students, but basically making sure that uh, the lecturers and the students have comfortable uh, teaching and learning experience. Um, so, and so on and so on. Uh, so this is like, there are two roles that we're doing here, being a faculty member and being a, a structural or a, a more functional member of the department in that sense. Uh, so yes, that's uh, my working life at the moment. Uh, and then the next is schooling. Um, Again, as the lecturers, you're expected to keep improving yourself, including, uh, including working on your um, degrees. Yeah? And then now I'm back to school uh, doing my STGA. Again, never have I ever thought about, you know, pursuing this STGA because I thought, you know, uh, up until now, um, it's not, uh, what is it? Not mandatory enough. They are not still pushing it, but uh, I think I have to thank here uh, publicly to Miss Udiana because I think uh, what what she gives off is the uh, is the the spirit of researching that I've never you know have the idea before or I have little idea of, but uh, Udi gives a lot of information and. Uh, bringing all, you know, opening up all the doors and windows of this research world that I've never, uh, or that I've never known or never been interested in before. So, uh, why that, you know, the, the research doors and windows has to do with SDGA? Because SDGA is all about research. Uh, 
so I'm doing my doctoral degree in literature at University of Indonesia right now. So basically what we do as S3, if you don't have any idea, we read, we write, and we research. That's just a lot of reading, reading, reading. And then after you read, you write, 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 whatever that you think it's right to write. <laughs> uh, to, it's right to be written on your thing, uh, on your uh, computer. And then, so that's basically all over uh, as a whole is researching. Uh, and then again, uh, um, continue to what Ms. Diana mentioned about having idealism. Uh, what I heard about doing uh, the doctoral degree is that you're not learning to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to read or to write or to do research, but you learn more to compromise. <laughs> so you, you, <laughs> you're expected to be able to, you know, have the compromise with, you know, what you what you read, what you write, what you research, and especially with your um, uh, prom promoters. That's what we call it here, yeah, promoters. <laughs> or we can, or what, what you know, as a dissertation supervisors. Um, so, uh, do I have the idealism? I don't know. I don't. I don't think that I have like a strong idealism towards something. Uh, but. Uh, later on, I, uh, in a bit, I will go to my, my you know, uh, short-term and long-term goals. But a little bit of my research. Uh, I'm, already, I'm at my third semester right now, and I have to finish my uh, research or dissertation proposal at the end of the semester. So this is basically what my research is about. Uh, this is not final, but this is at least what I have in mind. Um, so I will, I'll be talking about what we, what it's been hyped as digital humanities, but whereas digital humanities has been ongoing since the end of the World War II, where, you know, where, uh, humans are closely related to computerizations or computing. Um, but I think we're all now, we're li uh, digital humanities is now, we are all human living in a digital world. So I think that's, to put it more simply, I think that's that. So what I'm going to cover is the social media because we we love our social media. And then um, my questions would be around how productive the public is, you know, whenever there are certain issues, uh, the public are becoming productive in their, in their social media, you know, creating a Twitter thread or a meme or TikTok video in relation to whatever issues that are ongoing right now. And that's the relationship to the last bit, uh, which is the questions of what discourse that is going on and then what the representations they want to give off. Uh, so that's basically a little bit of my research. I have not been able to talk more about it because it's not ready or it's not finished, um, but that's, that's basically it. And then before I close uh, my presentation, uh, this is my short and long-term goals. This is like the future of where this academic career leads me to. At least for now, I have I want to enjoy my study because that's like my this is the the closest that I can I can uh, foresee my future. Uh, you know, at least in two years time, I want to enjoy my study and finish or graduate from my doctoral degree. But um, in the medium term goals here that I would love to have my own research focus. Research focus here as in, I want to have uh, an expertise of something that I write my research on just one topic for years. Uh, so if you heard of me and or I mean, if you heard of a certain topic, you think of me. So I think that's like the the research, the goal of having a research focus. Uh, and then my long-term goals, of course, because I'm already here, uh, um, ended up here in the academic journey and the academic career. So I want to keep on teaching um, because when you teach, it comes you know, in, in one package that you, that you also keep learning, keep doing research uh, because you want to always give, um, you know, 
current issues um, to the students. Uh, to close off my presentations, this is a very lovely quote from Maya Angelou. Um, if you get gift, if you learn, teach. So that's why I think what I want to do, um, at least, um, you know, for the rest of my life. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the time. I think back to you, David. Lovely. Thank you very much, Jesse. That was a really interesting, um, fantastic account of um, your career. Um, I particularly like your comment about um, the fifth being paid 12,550 pence an hour uh, for your first job and the fact that you were uh, you know, willing to say, okay, experience is much more valuable than money. And you did it for four years, which was amazing, really. So um, I get, um, I get attached with the students that I'm, I'm teaching, uh, because they are little kids. So I see them grow uh, in that sense. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, that's brilliant. Well done. Um, okay, so we, we're going to go to the question and answer session. Um, so, audience, please don't be shy. If you have a question, go ahead and type it up in the chat show. And um, I, I'm sure that everyone will be happy to answer the questions as best they can. Um, I've got a few here. Shall we start with Yuseva? Are you still aware? Wake, yeah, you said. Uh, have you? I hope you've got some coffee going. Yeah, <laughs> no coffee. <laughs> no coffee. All right. Um, well, look, uh, the, I'd just like to uh, some of the things that you mentioned in your talk. I'd just like to see if you can just tell us a little bit more. One thing that interested me was that you keep a journal. Can I mean for like the audience? watching would you have any advice on how they what they should do to maintain a, a personal journal because it's not like a diary is it it's different to just so, a diary yeah. <laughs> okay thank you for the question uh david yeah it's not like a dear diary journal um like talking about a crush or something like that but it's more on like uh, things that I am grateful for, for that day, and then things that I think uh, I still need to improve something like that. Because uh, for me, uh, learning English is a very long journey, uh, considering that I started from very zero English uh, when I entered uh, Sanata Dharma University, literally zero English. I mean, like, I, didn't really know uh, how to pronounce uh, pronounce she and she, things like that, Sim simple things like that. So yeah, uh, that journal actually helped me keep uh, my progress and also remind me uh, towards my learning purpose and also what I have to do in order to survive. So things, simple things like what I am grateful for today, uh, what I have been progressing, what I still need to learn, things like that. Yeah, and I uh, wrote it like every every day by the end of the day before sleeping. Did you find the discipline easy to get into the daily habit? Yes, because basically I love writing. I love writing so much. So yeah, I, I found it uh, easy to keep, uh, what is it, to, to be consistent and to be, yeah, to be consistent. And also, um, I tried to write in English. And right. then when I was like in semester um, seven, if I'm not mistaken, I read my journal since the very beginning of the semester, semester one. And I was laughing actually, because there are so many grammatical mistakes, misspelling and so on and so on. And I could see my, my own progress throughout the semesters. And for that, I'm so proud of myself. Uh, and I think that's one way uh, to appreciate what I have been done so far and to thank myself for that. So yeah, I think, and I think it's one of, one ways to, to keep my mental health too, even though like, you know, I have, I had to struggle hard, 
but then by the at the end of the day i made progress so i thank myself for that thank you so there you go everybody please consider starting your own journal now the next question is um, for jesse here and this is one from Mr. Handiko Wijaya, who asks, um, I'd like to ask Miss Jessie if I am able to do it, is it hard to be a lecturer? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think the mindset when you become a lecturer, uh, I think the mindset should be you facilitate, you know, you are not the person who know it all in the classroom. Uh, because I know I might know something that you don't, uh, and you might know something that I don't. And I, you can see the classroom as the container of sharing pieces of information. And I think that's what lovely about it. And if you have that mindset, I think everybody can teach, uh, um, or, or, you know, give lectures. All three of you could answer in turn. Th this is kind of about, um, it seems to me, you, you know, a lot of undergraduate students, when they're considering their future, they're kind of a little bit confused about what to do. Parents have got suggestions, friends might have suggestions, and then there's their, their own sort of personal interests and things. Um, do you have any advice on how people can perhaps reach a clearer um, decision or a, a clearer idea of what career path they want to follow? Maybe, um, Ibu Yuseva, would you like to try and have a go at that first? Okay, um, um, like for me, I think um, like what I already mentioned before, like finding your why, yeah, finding your why. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to go there? Why do you want to choose this one? Or why do you want to prioritize this? So I think finding your why is the most important thing. But then, I mean, like, since uh, students are still young, I also suggest them to explore the world, to explore their world, so that later, when finally fi uh, they find their uh, patient, then they will, they will really, they will really leave their patient at the end. So yeah, I think my suggestion is like, uh, I think it's normal to be confused, like for now for the students because I think their journey is still long. So yeah, just try to find your why. And I believe that your why for some people might change uh, along the way and that's okay, that's normal. But yeah, I think trying to find your way is the most important thing to do uh, starting from now and later uh, try to explore more and go outside of their own world. I think that my answer, my answer. Thank you. Um, Udi, what do you think? Um, just in career, was that the question, right? That was the question, right? Sorry? How, how um, to, yeah, how to sort of get past this, I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> do I like I get through that way? <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, Don't worry, I mean, say, if it's a stupid question, you can say so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, um, I guess in my case, at least I don't like I, I listen like a lot of students come to me, like even some of friends come to me asking me about career advice as well. The good thing, at least in my case, I didn't actually have that phase of not knowing what I want to do because like growing up, I know that I only want to be uh, a lecturer or an academia. But freedom is scary you know like <laughs> i think the best the best way is like scale of priority like do what you like in my case the reason why i want to be in academia because i like to do it and so like i limit my options so like 
girl, you don't have any option, any other career. <laughs> so like, be committed to what you want. So I think the thing is like, limit your own option because you can you can be whatever you want but that's the scariest thing about this life like you have that all freedom to be whatever you want and you have to know where to stop because if you're like keep on exploring thinking is it what i like is it what i don't like is it what i like do i need to explore any other career um you don't have that many time to explore everything like even though if you like you want to change in job give yourself a limit like five years maybe after that you have to like find something that you like i in my case i at least personally i think like limiting my option is <laughs> the way to like knowing what i'm like to figure things out it's like limiting my option because the more option you have like you you have to know where to stop i don't i don't think that's something that is too positive but at least that's how i deal with it okay Thank you. Thank you. So, Jesse, I mean, actually, one thing that came to my mind, I know you were telling us about, you know, you began it as you were doing actress stuff. And I know that you have a fantastic singing voice and maybe you could have um, gone into professional singing career, for example. Uh, how did you solve that dilemma of, you know, having different skills and which skills to kind of pursue um, as your career? Wow, um, I think it, it's all refer back to which do you enjoy most, right? Uh, I, I do still enjoy stage performing. Uh, I also, at the same time, I do enjoy teaching. So um, um, go back to what I experienced. It's just this teaching or, or this academic career came to me from, you know, questions from people. Do you want to teach or do you want to join the team? And do you want to, so there's just a lot of, um, I think the opportunities came to every one of us uh, in, in, any, in any kind of uh, forms, probably in the form of questions, probably in the form of, you know, email, but, um, it's it's i think it's us it's again the the the, uh, the decision is on us do we do we want to take the opportunity uh, or not uh, one of the one of the um, suggestion is that you know you, you try first if you don't like it you get out this is also what i think uh, miss udiana have uh, said that you know if you don't like it Probably yeah. you can stay. You have you give your yourself limit. Uh, probably two, three, four years. Of course, like three months is not like a good or not an ideal way to to put in your CV <laughs> because you haven't seen nothing yet uh, for three months. Uh, uh, but if you ask me, uh, and then also what Bu Yusefa said, I think it's okay to be confused, right? Uh, especially when you're at the young age. <laughs> and then we see that I was like. Uh, at a young age, Ms. Diana. Um, and then uh, if, you, if you ask me what, now that I'm not doing stage performance anymore, uh, that I'm more into teaching, why? Because apparently I don't like the industry. I don't like being objectified <laughs> in that sense because the industry um, asks you Ask a lot of you, uh, you know, personally, uh, in your personal life, uh, and then also, you know, um, your appearance. Uh, and as as I pursue my study even further, I I begin disliking the idea. Not that I don't love stage performing, but I don't I dislike the industry. Um, I spend my time on TV for one year and. There's just a lot of political situation as well, you know, everywhere. Um, but I think entertainment industry is harsh uh, in that sense. Uh, so I be, um, but in the English department, I have the outlet to 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 enjoy stage performance because at the time, now that we have it back on, we have drama performance classes. Uh, so I can um, let the students know what it is, you know, be uh, to be able to perform from my perspective and from my past experience. So 
um, so yeah, you can always find uh, things that you enjoy, and then you can always find things that you know uh, that help you um, with your career. Thanks very much, Je Jesse. That was great. So I think we can perhaps take three points. Um, number one, it's okay to be confused. Number two is widen your experience, try new different things. And number three is, yeah, um, say yes to jobs and projects and then assess whether you actually like it, feel comfortable about it, and then that will give you some idea about um, perhaps the areas you're interested in. Okay, now um, we've got some audience questions here. Um, the, the next one I'd like to ask is from Marta. And Marta asks, what skills make, make us, um, besides being fluent in English, um, what skills are, are needed as an English department student? So I'll, I'll, leave any, I'll leave that open to anyone who would like to answer that. The question was, sorry. Yes, um, besides being fluent in English, what other skills are important in, mm. as an English department student? I think critical thinking is like the most important things that we have to have now, especially when you're um, from humanities, like uh, if you're studying social skill, because as we know, like now the world, we have like AI everywhere that help everything easier, but something that AI doesn't have is that we have critical thinking. We can um, observe things better, especially everything that related with humanities. So I think critical, um, like while you're studying in English department, like you were asked to read some paper, probably it, it doesn't, seems that significant for your skill, or at least you feel like it's not, it's not significant, but then you'll realize later on in the real world, all those critical thinking and your analytic uh, skill that you learn from all those papers that you read, the problem solving, the, um, all the thing that you um, think wasn't that useful when you're reading those papers, it's actually useful. Like you observe people better, you understand the situation better, you came up with problem solution better because you get used to it. So I think in my opinion, it's critical thinking and analytical thinking. That's something that um, you have like, uh, you have to keep on um, improving over time. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Udi. That's nice, clear answer there. Um, the next one is from um, Dinda Mahar Ramadani. Now, um, Dinda here is teaching English at an elementary school, and she's experiencing these like um, confidence issues. As Jesse, you talked about the what ifs and the fear of not being um, good enough. And she says, you know, she's a bit prone to overthinking too much. So do you have any tips to overcome um, this lack of um, self-confidence, perhaps, and um, uh, pondering on the what ifs too much? Okay. Um, tips. <laughs> I think I just go with the flow. Uh, and then don't be embarrassed or don't be ashamed to correct yourself because sometimes probably you're giving off or I gave off incorrect information or when I didn't know something, I would just say it uh, because you don't want to, you know, oh, um, I need to answer it and I just answer it, uh, you know, gibberishly. Um, and then the students will give, you know, this gibberish information. So um, to overcome the fear is, I think, again, like I said, the mindset is that I know something that you don't and you know something that I don't. And we share. Uh, and then every time that I teach, I think there's also a quote that uh, from Joseph something. Uh, when you learn, when you teach, you learn twice over. Um, so 
it's about relearning as you teach it's about relearning and re improve it's re uh, improving yourself so uh don't be afraid i don't i i still have butterflies in my stomach every time i would i want to start a class uh but that's just still a good kind of nervous um uh, but the what if it's not worth it <laughs> Uh, so worth it. yes yeah. that's, that's well said yeah uh, be, yeah based on my experience it's just like you know just now change the mindset from what if to challenge accepted um, yeah I kept talking about the mindset like I have one uh, but that's what I've been doing at least Lovely. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, the questions are coming in now. The next one is from Daria Kansa. Um, I hope I got your name correct there. He's um, Kia, sorry. Uh, my name is Kia Benusian 2022. Now, um, th this person is asking about the um, perception that, uh, that, well, let me just read it out. I'm afraid that as an English literature student, there is the stereotype of when you graduate, you will only be teachers. Can you, can you sort of talk about that um, stereotype, please? Maybe Yuseva, shall we hand that one to you? Because you've, uh, what, what do you think about that? How, how can we overcome this stereotype? Um, for me, teachers are not only teachers. And I agree with Miss Jessie that uh, when you become a teacher, then you will always learn every day. I mean, like the privilege of learning every single day, I think is priceless and it cannot be counted by rupiah or dollar or anything else. Um, and also like what you mentioned before, Mr. David, that my previous, uh, previous students still remember me. So yeah, I think like being, a teacher is rich for me. It's not only a teacher. So just just be confident. Right. Like right. be proud of it. Yeah. So lovely, thank you. And you Seva, actually, before you go to sleep, I've got one more question from Gabby. Um, now, Gabby is talking about um, basically input from her parents, yeah? And it says, my parents still doubt me, even because if I'm an English literature student, I'm not going to make much money. Yeah, it says that being a lecturer or teacher doesn't make much. Um, it's not very uh, financially lucrative. What do you say to that? How much is much? <laughs> How much yeah. is much? How enough is enough? I mean, uh, just try because I think you can also like when you want to talk about uh, much in a way of financial um, like things, I think um, it's enough. It depends on how you are going to develop yourself. Like. Um, for a lecturer, uh, we are not only teaching, but we are also researching, like Miss uh, Udi mentioned before. And I think like we can also earn money from being a researcher if it is about money, you know. Um, you can earn money from uh, doing uh, community service and also from, from you know, like uh, for me, I also do translating. Um, I also make a book. Uh, I also do something else. So, yeah, um, do not only uh, rely on you being a teacher to earn money, but you can also do something else like your other patient or your other creativity or other, um, yeah, other, uh, your, your other potential. So then my question again, how much is much? Right, yeah, there are a lot Tell of- your parents <laughs> how much is much. <laughs> There are a lot of additional income streams that you mentioned there, Yuseva, that perhaps are not um, completely evident at the time. Okay, um, lovely. So I, I think that will uh, conclude all of the questions.
So let everybody please just hang on. And I think Maria, can you help me? We'll do the, um, we, we need you for the photographs now. Sure. So Maria, would you like to no. handle that? All right. Uh, I'm going to take picture of everybody starting from the first page. So I hope you can open your camera. Right, it's done. All right, lovely. Thank you very much for that, Maria. So um, this concludes our fourth webinar in our academic sharing session. Firstly, let me of course um, uh, give a big, big thank you to our speakers today, Yuseva, Udiana and um, Jessica. Also, thank you very much to Pak Irfan and Maria for your assistance. And last but not least, thank you to all of you, all of you. We had 181 participants, um, according to the information I have here, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for staying with us. And we very much look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Um, please leave the meeting as you wish at your own convenience. Bye-bye. If I may oh, okay, ask, sorry. Uh, the, sorry, David, to interrupt, but if I may give the information for the rest of the participants, there will be exit link where you can scan and then after that you can just grab your certificate from that exit link.